I will you fill out a form for the sandwich. So just, would you mind taking the filled out ones and just sticking them on the table there so that they can see them without getting an interrupt, too much of an interruption to it? Thank you. So since I have come to England, it's been a, so just over eight and a half years now, um, I've been blessed to come into contact with a, a good number of churches. Uh, and each of these churches, in, in, although they bear similarities to one another, um, have had their differences. Uh, differences in some doctrines, but also differences in their stages and the things that they were going through. Uh, some uh, were closing. Uh, some were struggling um, with attendance. Some were dealing with doctrinal issues. Some were dealing with sin issues. Um, and it's there have been some that seems like they're treading water, water um, and you say, well, what, what do you do? What do you do in those situations? What do we do in, in our churches? Um, each church has particular needs. Each one, each church that's represented here today has particular needs. And we, as ministers, have to figure out what do we do? How do we minister to those needs? Uh, the difficulty comes is that we're human, and oftentimes we don't actually know the needs very well, the needs of the individual that bear upon the, uh, the church itself. And it, I'm reminded of something that happened in the first pastor that I had back in Philadelphia in the mid-1990s. I uh, was there as an interim pastor and had been uh, welcomed in and, and, and started to, to minister. I was very young. I was 23 <coughs> years old. And there were a number of deacons. And I thought, this is wonderful. It's a, a small church. I'll be able to preach and learn and I'll be able to teach and uh, things will go well. It wasn't very long before I felt that there was a, uh, a spirit in the church, not, not a evil spirit, but a, a spirit in the church body of um, bitterness and some spite that, that I couldn't lay my finger on. I thought that a particular family was the originator of the of this attitude in this situation. And I thought, well, what do I do not knowing them in any way? How do I uncover this and, and, and deal with this situation? And as I prayed and I thought, well, Lord, what do I do? I said, Lord, this is what I think. I think it's them. Um, but if it's not them, or if it is them, you remove whoever you feel needs to, whoever is holding back this church. And you add whoever needs to be added. And I was very thankful for that prayer. It wasn't something that I wasn't brilliant in it. Uh, it wasn't something that was um, my brainchild or something. I had received good counsel. And I continued to pray that. And after a, a, a few months, um, I had a, a meeting with the deacons. And one of the deacons said, Chuck, I have to talk to you after. I said, okay, no, no problems. And sat down with this deacon and he started to lay bare all sorts of bitterness that he had. I thought, this is a bit of a surprise. The following Sunday, a lady in the church said, Chuck, I need to talk to you. Um, and it ends up that this deacon and this lady were having a spirited row and had been for years within the church that I had no idea. And the rest of the church had no idea about. It. But they were having a sort of power struggle as to who should be the most influential person in the church. And I brought them together. Had a meeting, started to talk through the issues, and continued to pray. And the day after the meeting, I received a call from the deacon saying, Chuck, my family and I are leaving. Just as quick as that. What have I done? <laughs> and he said, You have done nothing wrong. It's I just don't feel that we should be here any longer. Well, I couldn't do anything to convince him otherwise. He, he and his family are getting ready to leave. The next day, I receive a phone call from the lady. And the lady says the identical thing. She's leaving for because of this issue that has come to a head. And I thought, well, and I, again, the, the, no, no words that I had could sway either party. Uh, so that happens, and the church feels it the next Sunday because they're not there anymore. Uh, and they know it. And we had a meeting scheduled, a business meeting scheduled, and we gathered together, and there's all sorts of business to take care of. 
And this family that I thought was the root of the issue, they raised an, an issue, and I, I, I said, you know, that's a fair issue, but we're here for these things. Let's go ahead and table that and finish this out, and then we'll go ahead back to that. From that point forward, their spirit completely changed, and they became the, the, the foundation, not the foundation, but the pillars of that church. Their spirit was, was just in the wrong place because of something that they couldn't even identify. They didn't even know what's going on. And if I had gone to them, I would have created a problem where one hadn't existed. And thankfully, again, it wasn't because of any wisdom that I possess. I didn't do that. And it really ran <coughs> home to me that oftentimes I think I know what's happened. But very often in our churches, there are the, the circumstances of the lives are so diverse and there are so many things that are going on that we will not know what's happening. We'll say, well, what do we do? Well, I think that's where preaching on Revelation 2 and 3 comes in. Preaching on the seven churches in Revelation. And, and honestly, I think it has to be a habit of ours. Uh, one other thing that I would say in, in, in this long introduction, if you will, is that Eight and a half years ago, when we first came here, I, I began preaching through the Sermon on the Mount. And it was a, I thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, used the doctor as one of my greatest resources. It's a blessing to me and to those that heard. Um, now, I think in my head that all those that are sitting in my congregation have really been grounded in the Sermon on the Mount. But what I realized just the other day is the people that were here then aren't here now. And the people that are here now weren't here then. And so they haven't heard those sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. They haven't been blessed by those things. Now, that's uh, the nature of the situation that I'm in here. But I don't think it's probably that different than it is in other churches. Why? Because people are dealing with things. How many actually pay really that close attention all of the time to every sermon that's preached from the pulpit? We hope and pray that it's every one of them. But in reality, are there issues that are going on in their lives that are distracting them from hearing? I'd say that's probable. And so that revisiting topics and series and books that you've preached before is probably a good thing, not a bad thing, and probably needs to happen because it's things that you've studied that have really hit home to you. And I think that's true for these seven churches because there are so many things in these letters to these seven churches that will be such a blessing to our churches when we don't know the issues, when we don't know what's going on. We don't know if somebody's dealing with a personal sin that, that doesn't come to the light of day. We don't know that someone is feeling uh, that there just isn't the spirit there anymore. You know, the, 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 not the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of, of love and reconciliation and, and all of the things that we'll, we'll see, and there are many more than, than I, I will have listed. Uh, but I think those things need to be said frequently. Every two to three years, it would be a good thing to revisit at least a few sermons from the seven churches, in my opinion. Uh, you can differ if you like, but that's my, my particular recommendation. So after, having said all of that, I need to make one preamble after that introduction uh, about why um, I view the seven churches in Revelation the way I view them. Um, I have a very <clears throat> high view of local churches. Um, I believe that the local church uh, is the pillar and ground of the truth. Uh, that is, I don't think, something that is far off from you, uh, but I have a particular uh, thing that is probably a little different than most of you <clears throat> know, and probably uh, most of you haven't even heard of. And that is that I believe that the universal invisible church is a misnomer. That it shouldn't be called the universal invisible church. Uh, that might be a shock to you, but I believe it should be called the family of God. There are reasons for that. Um, when you examine what a church has, According to scripture, we find it has believer's baptism, it has the Lord's Supper, it has discipline, it has mutual accountability, it has corporate worship, it has officers, pastors, and deacons. When you examine those things that a church has, 
in light of a universal invisible church, you find that it does not have those things, that those things that identify what a church is don't apply to the universal invisible church idea. And because of that, I think that it's a, it's a wrong label placed upon it. I, I believe there is a bond of unity in the spirit for believers across the world, the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. But I think that, and if you want to talk about that later, that's fine and dandy. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but I think that, and, and I'm not making a point of it in the sense of you have to agree with me, and, and hopefully you don't get upset that I don't necessarily agree with you about that, uh, about the universal invisible church. But the reason I bring it up is because I think that that particular name has led to problems as other problems in our churches and for our churches, that when we think about the situation, well, salvation is found in Jesus Christ, not being a member of a church. That's no problem. All spiritual blessings are in the Lord Jesus Christ, the spirit, our inheritance. We understand that. That's the family of God. But the problem is that there is a low view placed upon the local church by Christians as a whole, Christians in general. We see very few attending. We see people that are now online for their for their ministry, if you will. We, we, they, they don't wanna actually show up in person. We enjoy uh, the, the, the Zoom process to keep us in touch during the pandemic, but there are a whole group of people that that's all they want now. And they think it's okay because they think, well, I'm part of a new church, when in reality, they're not part of a church where there is that mutual accountability, where there is that stone sharpening stone, where is that, that situation where you say, brother, come along, you need some encouragement or you need some rebuke or you need uh, something else. Every believer thinks that he is his own authority on scripture, which to a degree is true, but they're not sitting under the authority of a local church where a pastor has been studying. And when they sit down and they don't realize that this man of God has been studying for the past you know, 40 years, and this particular week, he spent 10 hours on this message, and they think, no, that doesn't mean that to me. Well, you just looked at it for five seconds, and I think it's rooted in the idea that there is this universal invisible church because there is no accountability. We, so often, the work of the gospel is placed into the hands of organizations that are not churches, that have no accountability to churches, and their doctrinal statements are quite different. That if they were a church and we sat down and said, oh, you know, I'm going to look at their doctrinal statement to see whether or not I want to work with them, I'd find out, most of us would find out that we probably wouldn't work with them. But because they're not a church, we're okay with it because the focus is the gospel. And I think that when we step back, we, we might see some of those issues are present. And that's why I think there should be such a focus on these two chapters of Revelation 2 and chapter 3, the seven letters that are written from the Lord uh, to these seven churches. I'm not going to talk about whether the cities that they're from. Uh, you can certainly do that, and you can delve into the, the particular things that are going, or going on in those cities. That is a great help when you're preaching on them uh, to find out. There, there are resources to that. I use a New Testament introduction by Guthrie uh, as my choice for introducing me and my people to a book uh, or to a letter about a city. I think it's a great help. These letters are written to churches from the Lord of his churches. The, the passage that, that um, I had Roger read, Matthew 16, 18, what does Jesus say? He says, I will build my church. I will build my assembly. Uh, they belong to him, and these letters are written by him to churches. Uh, and I think there is a something that we have to keep in mind about that. In Ephesians 1, he says, Paul says, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You know, we may be the ministers of a church, but it's not our church. It's the Lord's church. It belongs to him. And as long as it exists as a church, it is his church, first and foremost. And we, as ministers, have to recognize that and understand that we are under the authority and head of Jesus Christ. And remember that the teaching of the apostles throughout the New Testament are what? 
Are they brand new things that the apostles are introducing? Or are they the things that Jesus taught them? Well, they're the things that Jesus taught them. He says in John 14, of the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all three things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The apostles are not introducing new things. They're teaching us the things that Jesus taught us. And you can find those, those threads throughout the Gospels and the teachings of Christ. In Hebrews, the, the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 2, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Who has given us the faith that we possess? Well, it's Jesus Christ. He's the deliverer. He's the one that spoke it. As Jude 3 tells us, it's the faith that was once delivered to the saints. So why the seven? Why are there seven? Is there significance to that? Is it just a, a matter of convenience because it's some postal route, as some have said? Um, I think it's because there is something about the number seven in Scripture that, there, that, that shows us a completion. We can go back to creation that there are seven days in the week. God rested on the seventh day. Why? Because the work was complete. The work was over. Uh, there is a completeness to it. The Sabbath law for Israel the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the law of the firstborn, where after seven days you go and you present it to the Lord, the year of Jubilee. Uh, all of these things showing us about this number seven. You can think about the sins in, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 19. He says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination of him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that experience the blood and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. You can think about the seven spirits of God that are mentioned here for us in Revelation 1, Revelation 3, and how they correlate to Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. Uh, this idea that there is a completion that takes place. And it is my belief that Jesus sends these letters to these seven churches because whatever issue that is going on in any one of our churches is dealt with in the letters to these seven in some way or form. Now, it doesn't, he's not talking about park with colors or the way that the, the wall is painted or the car park or a tree that needs to be cut down, but he is diving into attitudes. How do we deal with one another? How do we... Uh, look to the Lord through these difficulties. And, and I think that when you apply these principles, these the, the biblical teaching that Christ gives us, then you will be dealing with the problems that arise in your church without a doubt, because you're dealing with these in, in depth. Sleep already, then it's really good now. But that Jesus is, if we're dealing with these things in depth and we're studying and we're preaching these letters to the churches, to our church, then we're going to be dealing with whatever issues have cropped up. And I think that it's evident by the phrase that he repeats so often that he uses in the Gospels a number of times. But that phrase that he uses where he says, he that hath an ear, sounds a little bit longer. Um, he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And the question becomes, do we listen? Well, do our people listen? Well, do they listen if we're not preaching on it, if we're not teaching them what's in these letters? So what I will attempt to do in the remaining time that we have together is note some things that are there for us in these letters. Now, we could go through and read every reference and we may spend some time and, and, and read a few of these things, but depending upon how much time we have, we may not read every single one of them. Uh, because some of these verses will cover more than one thing at a time. And, 
And as I've said to, to someone this morning, I don't rush through things. I don't say, oh, you know what, I'm going to preach on Revelation 2 and 3, and I'm going to be done in two, in two months, and I'm going to rush through it. Well, I don't think that's a, a healthy thing for our churches. Uh, I, I am one that I will dive in. Uh, the other night, we spent a, a, an hour and a half on one phrase from Hebrews 12, because there were questions. People needed to understand what was going on, what was being said. That's perfectly legitimate, because we want our people to grow. We're not in a hurry and then say, I'm going to cover these 15 books in the next, you know, 10 years, or before I die, I want to cover all of the New Testament. Well, that, I don't think that's a, that's a legitimate way to go through teaching and preaching the scriptures. So here are some things that you can think about that can, that can be seen in these seven letters. Number one, and I'll probably lose the numbering of that, so if, I'd say the next one, you can take the numbering if you're taking notes. The Lord will receive honor and glory in his churches. He'll receive honor and glory in his churches. And, and we see that, and, and it, it's something that is too often forgotten. It's, it's too often forgotten uh, when we look around us, and we always want to say, well, those churches but we forget it may be happening in, happening in our churches, that he doesn't receive the glory and honor that he should receive. And by preaching on these, I think we will bring out the honor and glory he should receive. So think about two, chapter 2, verse 1. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, we know those references back to chapter one, and we, you can talk about those things, but who is the authority? The authority is not the individual. The authority is not the pastor. The authority is Jesus Christ. And when you preach on that, you, you talk about the fact that he is the one that looks in the heart, the things that can't be seen. Uh, suddenly, people that are listening are, are going to be different because of it. Verse 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Who has the authority? Who is the one who has access to the tree of life? Verse 8, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamus, right? These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. The word of God, who does it belong to? It belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the word, and, and, a, and you can expound upon these things and expand upon these things as you're going through verse by verse to the point where people understand that, you know what, it's, even though you may have been in the church since, since it founded 50 years ago, it's not your church. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to move and work in this church the way he wants to move and work in this church. And those things need to be reiterated because there are times where we will come up against people who think, I run the church. I've, I've had someone say that to me. Uh, I wasn't the pastor, but someone, yeah, I, was, I was making a suggestion and he said, well, you know what? I'm the one who, uh, you just, uh, I'm going to step back and you just realize what you just said to me. Realize what, what the words that came out of your mouth and then look at scripture and then you come back and we'll have a conversation again because I'm not going to talk to someone who has that kind of a mentality. At all. That happens in churches, especially the longer individuals have been in a church and the, and the more that they've grown and the more that people look to them. Verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. But what a blessing it is to, to take those things, and you know, I'm not going to give you any of my personal thoughts about what he means by the white stone and the name. That's fine. You can, you can do that on your own. But those things are become a blessing to the churches that you minister to. Under the angel in verse 18 of the church of Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like the flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. The authority that Jesus commands in his churches, and we can go through, and I'm not going to read every one of them, but you can look at verse 23, verses 26 through 29. 
<clears throat> the, the one that gives such things that, that he's giving his authority as ruling with a rod of iron to the ones who overcome. In verse 1 of chapter 3, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And he knows what we do and what we don't do. He knows what's going on in our churches. I know thy works. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. He's going to give out white raiment in verse 5. He's speaking to the church in Philadelphia in verse 7. These same things say he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. And the authority that's there, and, and the idea for a, whether it's a small church, like the church in Philadelphia is, where you think, well, we don't have that much strength. Well, you know what? The Lord says, I'm going to open a door and no one is going to shut it. And you walk through it. What an encouragement that is. And then recognize when the door shuts and that you're not going to go through that door anymore. And you say, okay, that's, that's it. If the door is shut. We have to understand what the Lord is doing. In verses 12 and verse 14 and verse 21, there are all these reiterations about the authority and the ownership that Jesus Christ has for his churches. And you don't have to uh, do a, one sermon on that and, and follow all of those verses through. You can. But as you go, that's going to come through time and time and time again. And with that old phrase that we think of, um, a phrase, but that old thought that, that I think of, how many times do you have to hear something before you, 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 you remember it? I think it's 10 times you have to hear something before you remember it. That's not understanding. That's just remembering. Well, you see this in these, in these chapters. The Lord is saying things over and over again in different ways for us not only to remember, but to understand. The next thing, I guess it's number two, uh, the Lord builds, strengthens, and this is something that we don't think about very often, closes his churches. He is the authority. Going back to the passage that Roger read, what do we find? He is going to build his church, and the gates of hell are not going to stand against it. That means that when a church closes, guess whose fault it is not? It is not Satan's fault. It's not Satan's fault. It's the Lord's fault. He is the authority. He is the one that opens them. He is the one who builds them, and he will be the one who closes them. There may be varying reasons for that. As you find in, in these two chapters of Revelation, you find there for, for Ephesus, he says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove the lampstand out of his place, except thou repent. Why? They've lost the first love. They're the spirit of the Lord has left the building, if you will. And he's saying, you need to return to me, repent, or I will remove your king. You may still have the name on the building. You may still have the building, but guess what? You will not be any longer one of my churches. That's what he's saying to the church in Ephesus. We have to take those thoughts seriously. In verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Even churches will go through tribulation. They'll go through difficulties. They'll go through trials. And, and some of it will be, still, be squeezed very tightly. But Jesus knows that. It's not a surprise to him. He's only going, as, as others have said before, uh, Satan is a dog on God's leash. He's only going to go so far as God allows him to go. And, he, and, and the Lord has purposes for allowing these things. In, chapter, in verse 16, he says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. It's the word of God. He's going to bring it in. He's going to use that in the church. He gives warnings in verse 23 and verse 3 of chapter 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. That's not the return of the Lord that he's speaking about. That is judgment upon the church that he's speaking about. What about verses 7 through 10 of chapter 3? To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and show shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. 
and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I don't think he's talking about a great tribulation in the future there. He's talking about a time of temptation, a time of tribulation there for the church in Philadelphia. And he's saying, guess what? I'm going to keep you from that. What does that mean? I mean, I'm closing this church before that comes. I'm taking you out of the situation so you don't have to go through it. You will not experience that. Well, what that means is the closing of the church in Philadelphia. It's no longer going to be there. It's going to be taken away by the Lord because he's the Lord of his churches. They belong to him. And it's something that became a great blessing to me as I was ministering to a church that was closing because their membership had, had gotten old and, and others had died off. And, 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 and there were, oh, there's only two of us left. And, and what do we do? And why does this come upon me? You know, not every door that's closed is because of sin. There are some that that will close because of sin. Not every church that closes is because of heresy. There are some that will close because of heresy. Some churches close because the Lord said, you've done everything I've asked you to do. Your season is over. I'm going to remove you before other difficulties come. And those that he's left at the end are there because he's given them the strength to be there. And these are the things that come out when we preach through these things. He rebukes, he chastens. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. And as we do that, Lord willing, our churches will feel those things keenly. The, the things where, you know, sometimes when you preach and you get finished and you think, I don't know what I've just accomplished or if I've accomplished anything. And this person over here will say, that was such a blessing. I really, the, the, when you said this, it really made an impact on me that I said that. And then this person over here says, when you said this, it really made an impact on me. And I remember that, but those are two completely different things. It, it almost, it's almost as if each one of them thought I was preaching on something else. And, and how does that work? Well, it's because the Spirit of God is applying what's necessary to each individual. And as we go through these letters, there is all sorts of application that goes on. It goes on because of the way the Lord works. And then we, we think about the next. The Lord observes the efforts made by his churches and their motives. He, he looks at the heart of things. And, and I'll, I'll just give you, I'm not going to read them. Uh, I'll just give you the references. The Lord observes the efforts made by his churches and their motives, the motives behind those efforts. You can see that in chapter 2 in verses 2 to 4. You can see it in verse 6. You can see it in verse 9. In verses 13 through 15. In verses 19 through 25, over and over again, he's looking and saying, look, I know what you're doing. I know why you're doing it. And I understand the good, and I understand the bad. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Verse 8, verse 10, verses 15 through 17. And, he, and it's a constant reiteration of this theme that the Lord searches the heart. So that even though they, the, the, the congregation may be sitting there, and they don't... And they think, you know what? I'm so glad they don't know what I was doing last night. And you go through this, and suddenly they think, the Lord knows what I was doing last night. He knows when no one else will look. And he's going to do something about it in my life. Well, suddenly, a problem, a sin is dealt with that you and no one else in the church even knew about because of what you're preaching through, because of what's being said. The next one, and, and I think this one is, is something that seems like a stark contrast for, for me um, in the day in which we live, because the, the so much of the modern music phenomenon that goes on, and that you, you, you notice the issues that we have with the app when there's this great big long pause before the next verse. And, and I've had people say to me, well, I just, you know, I just don't feel the that the, the worship is really worship. And I'm thinking, he's making a joyful noise under the Lord. It's not about your skill or my skill or anybody else's skill. It's about communing with God through the things that we sing. 
but the Lord feels keenly the spirit that is in our churches. He knows our level of love towards him, and he speaks about it often in these chapters. He speaks about it to, to each one of these churches. He knows what's going on in their hearts, and he feels it keenly, and not just the individual, but the spirit of the church, the, the spirit that exists within the body. And when you preach through these things, there should be a self-examination that goes on for the individual and their part in contributing to the whole so that they recognize, you know what, maybe, maybe if the church is feeling a little dead, it's because I'm feeling a little dead and I've got to do something about it. And as I do something about it, maybe there's going to be a little more life in me and then that's going to spread to others. And then maybe it, well, there's a number of people in the church that are hearing that and feeling that same thing. And the spirit changes. The next one, the Lord sees, honors, and judges the way that sin is dealt with in our churches. He, he knows all about it. And he's going to deal with it much better than we do. We should be dealing with it. But there should be church discipline in our churches. If we see sin, we shouldn't be going out scouting and <laughs> trying to investigate everybody's life and, and, and lording it over people. But there certainly should be discipline in our churches. But we can rest assured that the Lord sees, honors, and judges the way that sin is dealt with in our churches. You can see it in Ephesus in chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, verse 6, verse 9. You can see it in other churches, verses 14 through 16. Verses 20 through 24, chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. You, you think about what he says here. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Over and over again, the Lord is talking about these things, and he is letting us know that he knows exactly what's going on, and he's going to do something about it. He's the one who's going to chase him. He's the one that's going to spew out of his mouth those that are not obeying. The Lord gives encouragement to those who might be struggling in the midst of churches that are not what they should be. And this is something that I think sometimes we miss when we think about the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, is that there is great encouragement here. The, the book of Revelation should be a great encouragement to any church where it's preached because of all of the things in it, but especially here in these two chapters. Everything ends, every one of them, to him that overcomes, I'm going to give such and such. Uh, to him that is obeying, all of these things, time and time again, you're going to get the tree of, eat of the tree of life. You're going to... Um, <clears throat> Pardon me. You're going to see the Lord. You're going to be given a stone that has a name on it. You're going to have this love and this, you're going to be ruling with a rod of iron next to your Lord time and time again. For those that are in the midst of difficulty, there's encouragement. Encouragement that their Lord knows they're going through the difficulty. Encouragement that he cares they're going through the difficulty and that they have something to look forward to. That this life is just a passing shadow. The Lord honors the preaching and teaching of his word in his churches. There's, again, a, a large number of verses you can go through, and you'll see that over and over and over again. He's, he is the one with the sharp two-edged sword. You can see it when he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said. How are they going to hear unless they're the preacher? They have to hear these things over and over again, and do we neglect them? I think I've neglected them over the years. The Lord knows the suffering that we are and will be going through. He knows about it. And he sees it on the horizon. And he's not removing it. He's not removing it. He's bringing us into it. And he has his purposes for that. And we have to understand that. You know, one of the things that I've, because of, uh, you know, the bad migraines that most of you know about, I've learned a lot about suffering, and, and I couldn't tell you how many times I've had people praying for me and saying, oh, I'll pray that the Lord removes it. Thank you. But is that what the Lord would have happened? Clearly, 
because he's been going on for 25 years to this point, it's not what the Lord would have done. Clearly, he has something else going on. Maybe the better prayer is that the Lord would teach me whatever it is he wants me to learn and make me into whatever vessel he wants me to be for others and give me strength and grace to go through what seemingly is not ending. Maybe that might be a better prayer for me. Well, that's the same idea that our churches go through. When we think about praying, what's the first thing that comes out of most of our members' minds? Faust. Will you pray for so-and-so who has this illness? Well, yes, we care about the illness. We care about the suffering. But what are we praying for? Are you asking for healing for that individual? Well, God may give it. It's most likely, in most scenarios, that those things that are being prayed for, God is not going to give healing. When someone has cancer, they're most likely not. They, they, they might, but most likely not getting healing. When a lot of things come into the lives of our congregations, and the first thought is, Lord, remove it. We're missing the idea that the Lord is Lord of his churches, that he is the one who brings these things into our lives. And these letters reveal that. These letters reveal that over and over again, that he is the one that is saying, you know what? Yeah, I saw that happen, and guess what? This is coming. And be prepared for it. Don't, don't, don't think that you're going to escape without it. It's coming, but I'll give you strength through it. It's just like what he says to Peter. Satan has desired to have you, to sift you as wheat, as wheat, but I have prayed for you. He didn't pray for him that Satan wouldn't sift him as wheat. He prayed for him that Satan would, that through that sifting, Peter would come out the other side stronger than he went in. That's because he, he the Lord could have said, but you know what? I said no to Satan. Well, he didn't say no to Satan. He said to them, that's what the Lord allows for his purposes. And our people need to hear that. That we're going to go through difficulties. But he gives strength. He brings us through and sometimes out. But it shouldn't always be the first thought, take me out. Lord, take me through. Make me stronger in you and in grace. The Lord warns severely those who are not what they should be in his eyes. We've noticed this as going through Hebrews. And all the warnings that you get through the book of Hebrews. Well, there are a tremendous amount of warnings here in Revelation 2 and 3. It's a tremendous amount of warnings about sin, about a lack of, of love, uh, about a lack of who we ought to be. In chapter 2, you have it in verses 4 and 5. You have it in verse 9, verses 14 to 16, verses 20 to 23. It's just in one chapter. And, it, and only if you're speeding through it so fast that the people can't even hear what you say, will they not get it. They'll get it. They'll, they'll hear those warnings because they're not said to unbelievers. These are written to churches. These are written to those that are still there and, and fighting against the heresy and fighting against the sin and saying, hold fast to the things that remain and, and, and don't allow the sin of Jezebel. Get it out. Remove it. Take it away. It's there in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, verse 9, verses 14 to 19. The Lord uses images and symbols derived from the New Testament and the Old Testament throughout. And that is a great thing. Now, we may differ on what we think some of these symbols might mean. But what they will do is drive you to the Word of God. Drive you to the Word of God. And drive your people to the Word of God. So that they will see connections that they might not have seen before. So that they will understand what is, what is happening through the pictures and these symbols. We see it throughout scripture that God is constantly using these word pictures that, that, that give us an image. You think about what he says about Jezebel in verse 20 of chapter 2. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Well, it's possible that the individual that's being spoken about is named Jezebel. I don't think that's probably the case. I think he's using the name Jezebel to refer back to Ahab and Jezebel and the sins that Jezebel committed back in the Old Testament to give you a clue as to what sins are being committed here in this church, 
and what sins might be committed in the churches that we pastor. Because it may not be the exact same thing. It may not be as blatant, but it may actually fall under the same situation. What does Jezebel do? And you can explore that. You can explore that with, with the, the, the field of, I just lost his name. David, yeah. And then you can explore that and how she co-opts the name of Jehovah and the people of God to then commit murder and idolatry in the name of Jehovah. Well, how is that possible? Well, how often in our churches are people distracted by the things of the world? And they're, they're worshiping, but they're not worshiping Jehovah truly because of the things of the world have in, entered in. And it's that sort of thing that God is, that the Lord is doing time and again here in these two chapters. The Lord is keen that his churches labor in the gospel in whatever way he gives opportunity. That's certainly uh, so evident there with the church in Philadelphia in chapter three, with the, he, there is no door that you're going to open that he has shut, and there's no door that's going to shut that he has opened. And it doesn't matter how much strength you think you have. If he's given you something to do, he'll give you the strength to do it. Don't put the cart before the horse. Don't say, you know what, we don't have the finances for that. We don't have the manpower for that. No, if he said do it, then start figuring out a way to do it. And he'll give you the strength and the means to accomplish what he's asked you to accomplish. These things come out in these verses. He knows the true worth of our churches. While we're frequently blind to it, how many times does he say, uh, as in verse 9 of chapter 2, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. They think they're poor, but indeed they're rich. They think they're the scum of the earth. They think they're the downtrodden. And he's thinking, well, boy, you are a shining light where I've put you. Other churches think they're rich. Like the light of the city, they think, well, you've got it all we're wonderful. <laughs> You're lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. We don't always recognize the value that the Lord places upon us, but it's good for us to examine ourselves so that we can see the issues and deal with them. And then finally, the Lord gives hope in all circumstances to the churches. These letters are filled with hope, filled with hope that are for, for the people that are in the midst of difficult times, difficult situations. And he says, you know what? I'm coming. You know what? If you hear, you're going to be encouraged. It, it, you're going to overcome. And, and I'm going to see you in the midst of all the things that are swirling around you. I see what it is that is in your heart. And I see what it is that you're trying to do. And I see you standing against sin. And I see you standing against heresy. And I am for you. And if he's for you, who can be against you? These are the messages that come through to me, and I think are clearly there for us each as we go through these verses, as we go through these churches, and we bring these to our people. And again, I think it's something that we should be doing, whether you want to do it topically every once in a while. I think it's better to do it expositorily because you're going to hit on so many things that you just may not hit on if you're choosing topics. And because you're doing it that way, your people are going to feel it, and they're not going to feel like you're signaling them out. That if you're choosing them to, to touch on a topic, but you're going through it, and you're going through it in depth, and your people are going to be, be convicted, and they're going to be strengthened, and they're going to be, be given hope, and they're going to be able to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what our, our goal ought to be, and recognizing that he is the Lord of our church, the church that he's placed us in. And the church that we, we minister in is, is his. And we should be saying the things that he said to his churches in the scriptures. And so that's what I have for us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck.